Great, so yeah, thanks for coming down. Um, great to see so many people. We don't normally get quite as many as this. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Mark. Um, I'm one of the people that run Worthing Digital, but this month I decided that it's about time I stood up here, seeing as I've been badgering other people to do it for the last six months. Um, so I'm a, a front-end web developer. Um, been doing web development since 99. Um, and tonight I'm going to be talking about responsive web design using Twitter, Bootstrap, and less. I'm going to have a technology failure. There we go. Um, so, just to give me an idea, how many people here would call themselves a developer? Okay. And how many have done some sort of uh, have used a CSS processor, preprocessor like less? Okay. Um, and what about Bootstrap? Has anybody done anything with Bootstrap? Okay. Good. Okay. Um, cool. Right. Well, let's get started then. So tonight I am going to talk about CSS preprocessors and explain what they are. We're going to spend most of the evening, or the first part of the evening, talking about less, which is the preprocessor that I know and the one that um, is included within uh, Bootstrap. Then we'll look at Bootstrap. And as part of that, we'll look at responsive design. So the last part of the evening is going to be sort of flitting between these two. But uh, that's about it. So uh, I'll uh, get started. So pre CSS preprocessors. Well, um, there's a number of them, uh, and let's first explain what they are. A preprocessor is a, a scripting language generally that um, you can use to generate CSS. So um, it's kind of programmatically generating your CSS for you. Um, I'll go into what that means in a minute, but it does mean it's kind of an extra step or another another layer in your development. But it does it can speed things up. Um, so we've got a number uh, available, there's less, SAS is another one which is fairly popular, um, Compass, which David I think I'm right saying is sort of related to SAS, right? Yeah, that is a preprocessor, but it is a SAS. Okay, <clears throat> so I've, I've not really used any of the others, but I've just sort of thrown a few up here because I thought we should make everybody aware that there are alternatives out there, but less does seem to be, you know, Twitter are standardising on this, so kind of follow the, the big guys, I guess. Um, <coughs> so, um, so yeah, the preprocessors right in that the browser can't directly understand, so you'll need to run it through um, a, oh come on, through a, <laughs> I've jumped ahead of myself. Sorry. Okay. So, what is less? <laughs> Any less is a uh, it's a superset of CSS, which means that any valid CSS is also valid less. So, anything you write in CSS, you can write in less, and it's completely valid. Um, what what less adds to CSS is variables. Right. So, common variables are really constants, but you can you can declare something and reuse it. Um, there are mixins, which is it's a CSS class that you can inherit into other classes. We'll look at those in a minute. Nested rules is part of the uh, the less syntax, which we'll cover later. And functions and operators, which are quite powerful um, when it comes to actually generating your CSS. So we need, as I say, um, less can't be understood by browsers. So we need a way of, of generating some CSS from your less, which your browser can then use. So there's a number of ways of doing that. Um, if you go to the less CSS org website, there's a little button that says download less.js, which is a JavaScript file which you can stick in the head of your browser. Then you can link directly to your less file, and the JavaScript will interpret the less and uh, turn it into CSS for you, which is okay for development, but really 
if you're going to deploy it, don't do that. It's going to slow things down. It's just not a good idea. Um, there are some server-side options. So if you're running <coughs> PHP or .NET, Ruby on Rails, there are things you can run on your server, which will take a, a less file that you deploy to your server and convert that into CSS on the fly for you, um, which, which could be useful in certain situations, but most of the time, compiling your, your CSS as you go along is probably the way to go. So we'll have a look at um, the, the compilers very quickly in a minute, but on uh, Windows, the main one is, is called WinLess. And on the Mac, we've got less.app and CodeKit. So let's have a look at those um, and we'll see how they work. My mouse. Okay. Um, okay, so first of all, this is the, uh, the less website. As you can see, um, it's a big download less JS button there, and they show you how to stick that in your head and use that in a page. Um, as I say, it's fine for development, but there are better ways of doing it, so we'll, we'll look at that. Um, Winless. So, basically, Winless and less.app look very similar. You've just got a, a panel on the left hand side and your files on the right. Um, and what you do is you drag a folder into the app that contains your less files, and then this, this app will then watch that folder, and every time you save your less file, it compiles it into CSS for you, and puts it in CSS folder. So here we go, this is, when, uh, this is less dot app, and as you can see, it looks very similar. Files, files on the left hand side, files here. Um, and finally, we'll just have a quick look at CodeKit, because that's the one I'm going to be using this evening. Um, now, CodeKit, <coughs> I think I'm right in saying that um, WinLess and um, Less are both free. CodeKit isn't, but it doesn't just do, there is a free trial, and I recommend you have a look at it, because if you're using a Mac, this is really cool. Um, it doesn't just compile your less, it will do SAS and all, uh, a lot of the other CSS preprocessors as well. But it also has um, JS Hint built in. So JS Hint, um, if you're not if you're not coming across that one, it will, every time you save a JavaScript file, it checks your JavaScript to make sure you haven't cocked up, which I nine times out of ten I have. Um, so it will uh, it will take like if you've left a semicolon off the end or you missed the curly brace or something, this will flag it up straight away for you, and it does tell you a lot of other sort of it will give you hints on how to improve your JavaScript code as well. Um, it will also minimise. Um, images for you and it will uh, reload the browser when you save an HTML file, which means that you've got one less thing to press. Um, which, you know, I'm lazy, I like, I like things that happen magically. Uh, so that's that's compilers. So you need to make a choice <coughs> which one of those you're going to use and, well, have a play with a few maybe, but um, if you're on a Mac, I would seriously recommend having a look at CodeKit and as I say, we'll be using that in a minute. So variables. Um, so anybody that's done any programming will probably know more or less what a variable is. It's something you declare and say, you know, I'm giving this name to this value. Um, so it lets you uh, hold on to properties such as colors or fonts, reference them once in a less file, and then you can reuse that value throughout your CSS quite easily. So um, if you're anything like me, when you're working on a big site, you might previously have put a lot of comments at the top of the file to say, you know, uh, this is the brand colour, and this is our alternative colour, and this is um, you know, a highlight colour, and then you go back to the top of the file and copy that hex value and put it back there where you need it. This basically removes that step. As long as you can remember what you called your variables, then you can just reference that directly. Um, and if you come up with a coding standard and you're working in a team, then 
everybody else in the team will know, you know what that is as well. You can also store text strings and variables, so for things like image paths, if you're doing background images. Um, can you concatenate them? Can you concatenate them? Uh, yes, yeah, so put, put more than one together. Well, because you could just do the root path and then the dot and then the farm name. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you can put a, you can put a variable in front of the farm name. Okay. Um, so that uh, which is quite handy for we'll come to this later. But if you're using different <coughs> background images for different resolutions, then you can change mm -hmm. the um, change the, the variable for farm name on back end. Anyway. Um, so that's variables, and now I'm going to show you some code. So, um, I can't spell variables. <laughs> um, so, here is a really exciting HTML page, um, completely unexpected, here, not styled. Um, but um, as you can see, we've got a couple of headings and some paragraphs. Um, so, if we look at the code here, so just a bog standard HTML file, nothing exciting going on. Uh, there's a link here to a CSS file, but if we look in the SS folder, we don't have an a CSS folder at the moment. Um, we've got, as I say, a couple of headings and some paragraphs. Um, so if we look in the less folder, I've got a styles.less and here are my variables. So in less, a variable starts with an at. So at container width is 750, at serif font is that, sans serif font is that, my background color is, f and I have a 999 copy color, and foo, because foo makes me laugh, um, as the heading color. Um, so, um, and then you can see here, this is, I mean, this is just like vanilla CSS, really. So we've got a color defined. And the difference is instead of having the hash value for copy color, or oh sorry, instead of using hash 999, I'm using copy color, at copy color. Um, and that's you can see like the width of the, the container div, is container width, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so far, so what? It's, you know, you, you might think you're wasting your time setting those variables, but actually, you're going you're gonna to be quite pleased a bit later on when you've got hundreds of. HTML pages and a massive you know, um, CSS file as long as you're wrong. So, um, <coughs> so that's that's the basics of um, variables. Uh, so, code kit. Let's print code kit out. Where is code kit? Code kit. Okay. Right, so here's code kit, like I say, to start drop your website folder onto this window. So that's what we're going to do in a minute. Um, and then we'll see that um, some files magically appear in there. Um, if I can find the files. Right, so. I definitely can't spell variables. Anyway, ignoring the fact that I can't spell variables, we can see now that it's picked up. There are two files in there. Um, we have styles.s and index.htm. So it's now watching those two files. And if anything changes, um, it will refresh the browser screen for one thing, and it will also um, generate my CSS if I save the less file. Uh, so let's do that. Um, I'm quite happy with all my variables at the moment, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick a, a space here um, and save that. And what you haven't just seen, because it's on this screen here, is a little uh, notification come up from CodeKit saying success. Uh, so if we look now... Come on. Okay, so if we look in the assets folder now, we've got a CSS file. Oh, it's here, up there, I need to do that. Um, so we've got a CSS file, as 
can see it's picked up all the variables as you'd probably expect um, that I set, and you don't see those in the CSS file. And hopefully, in the background, <coughs> Chrome is reloaded, and there you go. Does Code Kit reload your browser once it picks up a change? Yeah, it'll do it for Safari and um, Chrome, but not Firefox, because Firefox is missing some scripting capabilities that, um, that CodeKit relies on. So, um, most browsers, <coughs> but not, not Firefox. Um, so that's, that's variables. Is there any, any questions on that before we move on? Fairly straightforward, I think. Okay. Um, back to the slides. So the next thing is mixins. I'm oh, sorry, I just got um, Keynote this week, so I haven't used it before, and I've gone a bit nuts with the transitions. Um, so <laughs> sorry about that. Anyway, um, mixins um, they allow you allow you to embed the properties of a class into another class or another selector. Um, that's the easiest way I can describe it. And it, that probably doesn't make an awful lot of sense until you see it. But basically, you write a CSS class um, as normal, and then you can basically stick that class name inside another selector, and that selector will inherit everything that you've got in that class. Um, um, Mixins can also take parameters. So you can pass in brackets after the, the class name a parameter or a number of parameters, and um, that means you can produce different results with the same mixing, which is quite handy. We'll have a look at that in a second. Whoops. Go back. No. Oh, anyway. Um, <laughs> let's have a look at um, let's have a look at mixings. I wonder if I spelled that right. So again, we've got um, an assets folder with a less folder in it, and nothing else. Um, and again, we've got a styles, um, a styles not less. Um, but there's a couple of things going on, uh, one of which I didn't want just yet. So let's come in there. So we've got this class here called round, uh, which is a mixing, uh, and we've got another one called .fs, which we'll look at in a minute. We'll look at round first. Um, so uh, you'll notice first of all that there are brackets after rounds. Now if this was a parametric mixing, we'd be declaring our, our uh, parameters in there, but we're not, it isn't. So these brackets are optional, but they are quite useful because by putting those brackets in there, it means that when when the less app generates less for you, it won't. Uh, sorry, it generates a CSS. This won't end up in the CSS file. Um, so that basically hides it from the end CSS. So these rules here will only apply when you put the round inside something. So hopefully, if I've done this right, um, we should have down here. Uh, yeah, dot round. Okay, so if I uncomment this now. Uh, okay, so at the moment uh, we've got a heading colour which is going to be food, red, and a background colour which is background colour which is white. So if I put what this, this mix in here does is add rounded corners. If I put rounded corners on a white background, you're not going to see that. So what we're going to do is we're going to make colour background colour, and background colour will be colour. <coughs> so now we're going to have white text on red background, and not 
something happened. Oh, because hey, code kit. I haven't added it to code kit. Um, in fact, what I think I'll do is I'm just going to add everything to that so that doesn't happen again. Okay. Right, so I can click on that and I can compile it directly from there. And now we should have really rounded corners. It's not very clear on the, uh, on the predictor. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so that's, that's a, a simple um, non-parameter driven um, mixing. Any, anything that we apply that class to will get five pixels rounded corners. Could you think of a mix as an extended variable? Yeah, it's exactly what it is. It's a, it's a variable. It's a class, so it's, it's, it's essentially it's a variable. But it's it's you can have you know as much as you can fit into a class in the mixing. Um, now, the one of the advantages of using mixings for stuff like this is that um, border radiuses and box shadows and things like that are a bit of a pain at the moment because we still have to use. Um, for vendor prefixes, prefixes for um, a lot of the newer browsers. Thanks for um, So, um, you know, it would be really nice if we could just type border radius once <coughs> and done with it, but we can't. So, without having to remember all your vendor prefixes, if you stick them into a, into a, a mixing, you can just use that everywhere. Um, so, we'll have a quick look at this one. <coughs> this is a, a parametric. Um, Mix in, and what this does is uh, say so .fs is for font sizing. Um, what we're doing here is we are declaring uh, this is like a default font size, so 12 pixels. Uh, then we've got base and base font size. Um, so what we do, we pass a variable in, in fact, we pass two uh, pixels, which is um, our target pixel size, and base, which is whatever the pixel value of the fonts in the parent element are. So, <laughs> so um, browser default, generally, anybody know what the browser default for a font size is? 16 pixels. Thank you. So 16 pixels is the standard um, browser font size. And in the past, we've done stuff like um, at the, the root level, we've um, divided that by 67% or something to give us a 10 pixel base font size, and then use them from there. To, uh, to calculate pixel font sizes. What this allows you to do is as long as you know what, what the parent font size is, then you can get whatever font size out that you want. So by saying .fs 12, 16, if I know the parent is 16 pixels, then I'll get 12 pixels out. Um, like, oops. Like, have I done it? No. So let's do that on here. Let's do something like, uh, .fs, so let's say we want 32 pixels just so it's nice and big for people at the back, 16, um, and that's that. So, that worked. Woo! Um, so there we go, we've got a nice big font size there now, and if I look at the CSS, you'll see what it's done, hopefully, is, yeah, we go, font size. Is that better? 200 pixels, sorry, I can't scroll that up anymore. But, um, so that's what's been generated as font size 200 pixels, and that would you know, apply anywhere else. So it's quite a nice little, once you get your head into it, it's quicker than using mcalc or something like that for working out n values for, for pixels, for pixel sizes. So those are um, a couple of mixins one I wrote, one I've stolen from somebody else. Um, the nice thing is that uh, some other people have kindly put together some libraries. There's one called Less Elements, um, which is just a less file, which you can just download using this download link. Um, and if you save that into your uh, folder like I have here, uh, Elements or Less, you will find that there are a bunch of uh, quite handy uh, predefined mixings in here. 
which you can then use in your code. Uh, so I've got, um, I was going to give you an example of that, but I think you probably get the idea. I can, I can show you adding a, a gradient to the background, but actually looking at time, I think I'll, I'll leave that. But that's worth having a look at if you do decide to, uh, to look at less um, in a bit more detail. Okay. So nested rules. <laughs> um, let's you nest selectors one inside the other. It's a it's a sort of syntactical nicety, I guess, in a way. It lets you basically you can nest stuff inside the curly braces of, of other selectors, and um, your compiler will figure out the um, specificity for you and build the rules so that when you whoops was that it. Um, so yeah, it, it can be nice for sort of shorthand, but it, it can also cause you pain down the line when it comes to debugging because you know what you're seeing in your less is not what you're getting in CSS, so it might not be the best thing to do. But we'll look at that. I've got. I can show you an example of some this. Uh, in, in terms of debugging, though, do you yeah. get, if you do something wrong, would you get like a debug message within? So if you if you screw your less up, you get a. a, a let me do that in a minute. I'll, I'll show you. But yeah, um, code kit basically goes no. Um, but if you um, if uh, if you, you, you know if you haven't messed your, your less up, it's perfectly valid. But it's still breaking something in your HTML and your CSS. Yeah, sure. um, then it can be a bit tricky to, to sort out the specificity. So um, you know if you're nesting 16 things deep, then you're asking for trouble. Basically, it's it's, it's nice for shorthand sometimes, but not. I've mm. heard it's a rule of thumb if you go four levels four, deep, yeah. that's as far as you yeah. go really. That's what I've heard as well, so yeah. yeah. So people say. Um, <laughs> right, so functions and operators. Now, I have to admit, um, this is an area that I'm less so fake with. I've done quite a bit with mixings and, and stuff like that, um, but not so much with this stuff, um, mainly because I'm not a big fan of JavaScript. And, as you can see from there, functions map one to one to JavaScript code, which means that you can manipulate your CSS with JavaScript style scripting. So, if you're a you know, JavaScript guru, then this might be this might really um, get you hot, but it doesn't really float my boat too much. Um, operators, though, <laughs> can be quite handy. Um, Operators are like mathematical functions that you can do on your on your less. So they let you add, traps, subtract, sub divide, multiply um, stuff. So um, for example, properties, values, and colors. So I've got an example of that to show you. Um, for a, an experiment, I thought I'd have a look at um, something that Andy Clark has done, which is to generate a uh, a color uh, sort of. Uh, Color theme from one hex value. Um, so here's my HTML file. Has anybody got a favourite hex value? Well, somebody must have. <laughs> anybody? James? No, don't say zero zero zero. Zero zero zero. Foo. Right. Um, <laughs> okay, let's have a look at that in a minute. Let's say, so what we've, what we've got here, let's have a quick look at the, um, let's have a quick look at the, HTML file first of all. Okay. Um, so like I said, what we're going to do is we're going to create a color palette. Our main color is going to be here, and then we're going to have a complementary color and lighter and darker colors as we go down the page. It's really Let's exciting. Let's look up uh, Daring Fireball's color. It's probably the most famous text value. Okay. Uh, the browser. Um, 
Okay, well, well, I think we might go with the... Uh, do, a, do an orange then, F9-0. Okay, right, we'll do that. So, let's uh, let's just have a look at the code quickly, first of all, and see where we can work out what's going on here. So, we've got a less file, um, and it's basically the same as the... I'm in the right place, yeah. So, this is pretty much the same as uh, the other the other less files. The only difference here is that we've got a container width, which I've set to um, 800 pixels, uh, and a swatch margin of 10 pixels, and a swatch size, which is uh, container width divided by 4 minus 10. So, what are we doing there? We are taking 800, dividing it by 4 to get 200, and taking 10 off for the margin. Uh, which, if we go down to here, ah, come back around there. In fact, so that, that's our variables. Okay, so now here we have a nested, a nested, um, nested selector. So I've got a UL, and inside, I haven't closed this bracket, inside there I've got a dot list reset, which is my mixing, which is up here somewhere. And what that does is it sets everything to display block, float, left, list style, none, margin, zero, padding, zero. So it's going to take a lot of the default styling off and float everything left to give us some squares, which we'll see in a minute. Uh, so the div sets a container width, which is 800, margin auto to stick it in the nice in the middle of the screen. Um, yeah, copy colour, all that stuff we had before. So nested, nested selectors. So the UL is going to inherit that list reset class that we've got up the top there and float left and lose all its margins and everything. The last child, oh sorry, so LI, is going to inherit that as well. The height and width are going to be set to squatch size, so we have a nice square. Um, <coughs> maybe I should run this and then go through the code, that might be better. Um, let's do that. So, uh, what I need to do is <laughs> down here, um, this is where the colour goes. So, what do you say? F9? F90. 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 Okay. So, let's save that. Hopefully, I've got the CSS file. I have. <coughs> Ooh, right. Okay, so here's F90. And somehow we've generated a blue colour. So how's that happened? <laughs> um, no, it meant to do that. Um, so let's have a look and see how that happens. So we've got our colour defined here. F90. And then comp. Now comp is the complementary colour. And what we've done is spun coal 180 degrees. So, round the colour wheel 180 degrees to get the blue. Follow yeah. so far? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Then what we do is we take coal and we lighten it 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%, and darken it 5%, 15%, 15%, 20%. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, and then down here we've got uh, the classes that I've assigned to the, uh, the less, so literally each one of these maps to a variable. Um, and that's the background colour for the, um, the list item. So each list item, like I said up here, um, has the height and width of the swatch size, which is, what did I say, 190 pixels. Um, margin right is swatch margin, and the background colour. If we hadn't done anything, they'd all be orange, but because we've done magical jiggery pokery further down, they've all got different background colours now. So we've got our original colour, our complementary colour, our lightning colours, and then our complementary colours afterwards. So it's quite a nice way of quickly generating colours for use in the, in the site. And, uh, Yeah, without using paint. Yeah. Uh, so, if I'm out of the uh, there in five, we'll end up 50 shades of grey. Uh, <laughs> 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 I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> so, that's, uh, that's operations. Are they then assigned to variables? Yes. Yeah, so, so, right, so you assign them to new. Yeah, so. So 20% so lighter. Yeah, so here, here's, a, here's a variable called color one lighten one, or L1 right. for lighten. Sure. And then down here, I've got a, a class that directly maps to that. Cool. Um, 
and then that's assigned to the first uh, list item on the second row. Okay? Yeah. Any questions? So in a nutshell, um, that's less. So it's it's variables, mixins, which are variables, which are classes, uh, nested rules, functions, and operators. And when, can you ask when you output your CSS? Can you output a different compression size? Or yeah, you can. So um, sorry, you can sorry I was going to show you. Let's just before we move on then. So um, so uh, let's bring up code kit. Um, so I've got my uh, my uh, style less here, which you can see it's going to output to us. It's style styles. Yeah. Uh, you can change where that's going, but that's like the default location for it. Uh, you can get to run less, which is some sort of CSS validator. It will uh, enforce strict imports. Ah, that's something I shouldn't mention. Is it? Um, well, I'll show you in a minute. You'll bootstrap. Uh, output style. You've got regular, minified, and uh, YUI compression. Um, and you also got com don't compile directly, which is because on a lot of stuff you're going to be importing less files into other files, and you don't want them to try and um, compile straight away because the variables will be stored somewhere else, and then it'll crap the pants. Um, Can you, you, is it possible to put comments into your less file? Yeah. So do not appear in your CSS. Yeah. Or? So if you do a single line. That might show up. If I do a, uh, where's my, that's a lot of <coughs> there. If I do a uh, multi-line style comment, that will show up. So, um, should have stayed in. Sublime text, ooh, it's exciting. <laughs> um, here we go, so somewhere down here, if I'm in the right, Project, which is not. Uh, somewhere. Oh, yeah, there we go. Boom. So the other comment isn't there. So single line comments don't appear, multi line ones do. And um, in answer to your question about how it lightens and darkens things, I can't really tell from that, but it looks like it's doing maths to me. Was yeah. that a code kit thing or is that a, a less thing, the whole single line code I think it's less right, okay. standard, yeah. Um, I think SAS, but, SAS does that. Mm. Okay, um, so just before we move on to, um, on to uh, the next thing, which is bootstrap, let's uh, try and break something and uh, see what happens with Coke here. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, well, I can't break it from the CSS for a start. Um, that will probably do it. Yeah. So, so you get a parser error, um, and most of the, the um, sorry guys, I can't uh, get that thing high, but basically it says uh, it went wrong with this line. And it doesn't give you much more of a clue than that, but um, at least you know where to look. So it's a bootstrap. How many people have used it? Two, three. Okay. So what's in it? What is what is Twitter Bootstrap? Um, it's a framework um, developed in-house at Twitter, which um, is used for developing websites. Um, it requires the HTML5 dog type because it makes use of some new HTML5 elements. It, has a reset via normalize.css. So a lot of times when you do a reset style sheet, you basically remove all the styling from everything and start from scratch and then start adding things back in again. What normalize does is it keeps the good bits um, from each browser and then builds up from there. Uh, you get base styles for typography and links. <coughs> you get a 12 column grid. Um, 
can get uh, fundamental HTML elements style to enhance with extensible classes. I'm linking this from their website. Um, <laughs> you get dozens of reusable components built to provide navigation alerts, popovers, and more. And 13 custom <coughs> jQuery plugins. Um, I do know that uh, they have also got, or well, somebody's actually taken the jQuery and written it as Mootools. So if you're a Mootools developer, then um, there is a flavour for you as well that you can download. So um, when I started doing my talk, preparing for it, I, I did a, a, a mind map, and this is a small part of it. And I started going through the bootstrap site and going, right, I want to talk about that and that and that and that. And, that. and I basically went, oh, God, I'm going to be there all night. Um, so what I decided to do is rather than sort of me stand up here and, and talk at you, we'll actually look quickly at the, uh, at the bootstrap website and get an idea of, of what's in the, in the framework. So uh, we'll do that and then we'll move on to some more demos. So... Okay, so <laughs> there's an interesting thing. Um, yeah, it's good causes a bit of an issue because we're in because uh, we're using a projector. It's actually um, gone into like the, the sort of mobile mode. So uh, normally you'd have navigation across the top there, but because the, the screen's quite narrow, it's it's hidden that. So we might find that happens with all the demos, which can be a bit of a problem. But anyway, um, so here's the navigation. Um, That's a general issue with responsive design. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so here we go with uh, with, with the, the bootstrap site. Um, now, uh, one thing to point out is that in the past when I've downloaded bootstrap, I found that clicking this button gives you everything but no less files. So you get the CSS but no less. So if you want to use less, don't do that. Um, go to GitHub and clone it or uh, um, grab it from there. Just I'm going to right. Um, I need to look at this because my notes are in the slide. Um, okay, so uh, let's have a look and see what. So we start with uh, scaffolding. There we go. So we've got some global settings, as I say, it requires the HTML5 doc type. Um, and it starts off by um, so set by normalize and a grid. Now um, we'll look at the grid in a minute when we come to uh, demonstrating some pages, but uh, essentially we've got 12 columns and everything could be one column wide or it could be any combination to give you a nice, nicely structured page. Um, here we go, so we have rows and spans. So if you have a class of span four, then it's going to be four columns wide, it's eight, then it'll be eight wide. And you can offset, push and pull, nest columns, uh, all that might be not very interesting at this stage. You can also have a fixed layout, so if you're not wanting to build a responsive site, then do that. Um, and you'll have a, a fixed site like you normally would. The columns is quite handy when you've got a designer who's designed to a grid. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's where it is. Very yeah. Handy. So we've got uh, base CSS, which gives you some nice, sort of fairly standard rules for headings and copy and stuff like that. I mean, standard stuff that you'd normally go through and set up yourself when, uh, when starting a site. They've also got some stuff that I'm not sure I use all that often, but addresses are nicely formatted and block quotes and stuff like that. Um, if we look at tables, they've got some reasonably nice default table styling. Um, you can add zebra striping really quite easily, um, which we use uh, end child to go and style your, your table, and you've got all sorts of fancy pants, um, you know, borders and stuff that you can add on. Uh, but that's not really the exciting stuff. I quite like the form styling stuff I've done because forms can be a bit of a pain 
to make it look pretty. Um, so they've got some nice new sort of uh, takes on some of this stuff, inline forms are already sorted out for you, horizontal forms. Um, and then we've got stuff like, yeah, done all the checkbox stuff for you as well. Everybody that's done the forms in the past and like getting them to line up nicely can be a bit of a fag. Um, what I was looking for is that, uh, this stuff here. So quite often designers will put things like, you know, decimal points after an input so that the user doesn't pipe that in, it's already there for them. And this is just in you know, actually submitting back to the server. Um, or an app for a username in the front, and there's a bit of placeholder text here and that sort of thing. Um, you can have before and after, so on and so on. Um, so that's all quite nice. But buttons, quite handy. So they've got default button styles. They've got a bunch of uh, classes for various states. Um, and then you can have large button, default button, small button. So the way, um, this is one of the things that I'm a bit conflicted about with, um, with boot camp, base camp, is because if you want to get a big button and you want it to be blue, um, then you're probably going to end up using three class names for it, um, which I don't really like, but I guess with a framework, you know, there's no other way around it, otherwise you're going to end up rewriting all that code. So it's kind of a trade-off between nice non-presentational class names and guest rock. Could you just add uh, a simple less class of your own that just mixed in those three properties? Uh, you, uh, you can. I tried that with um, some grid stuff, not using Bootstrap, but using uh, the uh, Blueprint uh, okay. less framework. And yeah, it does kind of work, but then you end up with... More CSS. Yeah, more CSS. So it is a trade-off between less CSS and more classes, or more classes and less CSS, so it, I guess less CSS is probably what we're after here. It's also handy when you hand it over to someone who's not as technical. Yeah, they can understand that a lot easier. Yeah. Um, but, you know, from a, from a sort of purist um, semantic HTML, I don't want any presentation markup in my, uh, in my HTML kind of background. That does, is a little bit like fingers <laughs> nail, fingernails down a blackboard, but um, but it does the job, and you know, it does it quite well. And I'll show you in a bit um, something I've done with uh, with with Luke Camp, although I suspect it's going to look awful uh, because of the width of the screen. Um, but anyway, we'll have a look at that in a sec. Uh, so let's go on. So I don't want to spend too much time going through um, here, but you kind of get the idea. There's, now they've released a new version of. Um, Bootcamp last week, and um, they've added the, the uh, little sort of icony things around the uh, the input fields is one thing they've added. And this is another new thing they've just added, which is a few little classes for um, presenting images. So you can now do a circular image really easily, uh, which will just add border radius to your image, um, and as these two do, and you've got a polarized style one there, so it's quite nice for sort of quickly putting. Um, a bit of something extra into your uh, images without uh, having to go into Photoshop and actually edit those images. Um, so, and the last thing really to, oh, no, else. the last thing probably to look at is the uh, icons. Now, um, Twitter have got an agreement with guys that make these glyph icons uh, to use them in uh, in Basecamp. So normally, these are not free for use, but if you're using Bootcamp. 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 Bootstrap. 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 <laughs> this thing here, if you're using this, you can use these. Um, now, the way, they, the way they do these... God, somebody give me a beer. Um, I should more. Um, the way, they, the way they've, they've implemented these is kind of interesting. What they do is they put a, an empty um, I tag with a class on it to, to give you an icon. Because uh, in CSS uh, HTML5, I um, it's sort of undeprecated, but doesn't have any semantic meaning associated to it. So it's kind of a, a, a tag for adding, uh, I can't remember how the W3C described it, but it, it, you know, this is kind of a bad juice for it. Um, again, 
I'd probably prefer it if they were background images, and there's nothing stopping you from doing that, but the sort of default way is to stick it in an eye tag, and, uh, and that's that. So if you, can you use those if you're only using a small part of Bootstrap? Yeah. Could you use those as well? Yeah. yeah. Well, what license is Bootstrap? Uh, I've got a feeling, but I can't remember, but I think it's, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's an open source share alike type. Um, GPL. Is it GPL? Yeah. Okay. Um, but it's, uh, the, uh, the icons give you these sorts of things. You can use them in uh, conjunction with buttons to get sort of WYSIWYG type uh, button effects. Um, and this is how you do it. So you've got, uh, in fact, yeah, there we go. So we've got an eye tag, which isn't empty. This thing. It's the racking, it's yeah. got a castle here. Yeah, exactly. So icon one left, which is so the, so all of the icons have got a, an icon prefix to the class name, and that is a line left one, and similarly, that's justified. Um, so I'll show you. So you've got user and stuff like that. They've got back and white versions of the icons as well, so if you're using them on a dark background, you can use inverse version. Are they done using a font, or is the, or, or the actual background No, they're actually background images. There is, I think, there is a font version of it available, oh. Oh. but they're not implementing that at the moment. Um, so there we go. Um, so that's sort of the base CSS stuff. Um, so most of the stuff in the sort of base CSS are, is for sort of individual, um, individual elements. And then when you come on to what they call the components, these are kind of um, putting more than one element together to give you a thing. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, you know, you've got a number of uh, items here in a, in a list with some styling on the video separated. Um, uh, drop down list, that's not a great example. There's some button lists further down here. We'll just go to those. Uh, button, 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 uh, button drop downs. No. Uh, we see button lists. Progress bars, levels and badges, there's loads of stuff in there. I mean, you can see um, that there are things like hero units, <coughs> which are used quite a lot. Uh, alerts, kind of handy. Uh, progress bar, yeah. Um, so this, these are kind of, as I say, a, a, a collection of other elements that you can throw together quickly, and they've already done a lot of work for you to give you something that looks quite nice quite quickly. Um, so that's that's the sort of bulk of what's in Bootstrap, um, and then from there, I'll do it right. uh, from there they've got stuff to enhance that even further with uh, JavaScript. So that will do stuff like uh, mobile overlays and um, it's quite nice. So as you scroll down the page, it watches to see where you are and shows you in the navigation, which is quite handy. Um, you've got carousels and type ahead. Um, all that sort of stuff is in the framework ready to be used. And some of this you know, it's pretty handy stuff. So how do we how, how do we start to use it? So, first thing to do is to go to <coughs> GitHub, there, click on the download zip button, or clone, because if you click the download button from the root the site, then you're not going to get the less, which you'll probably want. Then we're going to rename the extracted folder to assets. The next thing I did, because I'm lazy, is I went to there and grabbed an example HTML file so that we can start building straight from there, example, and not have to try and figure everything out. We can learn as we go along. You have to save the source file, obviously, the source of that file into somewhere where you've got your bootstrap and change some paths. I got caught out by this because I didn't realize that jQuery doesn't get downloaded with bootstrap. So though all the JavaScript plugins in the library rely on jQuery, they don't actually give you jQuery. So you have to go and get that as well, or link to the CDN to get it. 
and then gasp in amazement when it just works. <laughs> um, so let's have a quick look at some code. So here we go, here's an index.htm. This is, uh, I should show you that interesting, in fact you'll see it in a minute, but um, so this is this is um, this is one of the demonstration files from uh, Bootstrap. I have had to change the assets path because they had it from the root of a web server, and um, had to change a couple of other parts in here as well to get it to work. Um, assets. This is what you get when you download Bootstrap, and it will be called something like Bootstrap 1.0. So you just call it assets because that's what we call an assets folder. Um, and as you will see, I have a ton of less files here. Um, an absolute ton of them. Uh, in fact, there's a lot there. Um, but when it's compiled in a minute, you'll see that in actual fact, we don't get that many CSS files out of it. Um, so let's do that quickly and then I can show you what that looks like. Um, and you'll be amazed. Um, so it's probably going to go into right. Um, okay, so this is this is I'm just like HTML. Um, that's not what I wanted. Files. Okay, so uh, in CodeKit we'll see that um, although all of the less files that are in the folder appear. Only two of them are actually bold, the others are all sort of greyed out. Uh, if I click on something like utilities.less, you'll see that uh, do not directly compile is, is ticked. Um, so let's have a look at um, bootstrap.less, and that doesn't have that tick, which means that that's one of the files. Where there. is CodeKit getting that information? Do the files have some kind of header that, that no, are implying that that should happen? No, I think what it is, although I, I haven't really looked into this in too much detail, but I believe what happens is. If we look at um, bootstrap.less, you'll see that it imports reset.less. Right. So anything that's imported into another file doesn't get directly compiled. Um, so you can see this is the reset file, variables, mixins, blah, blah, blah. All of the, uh, all of the less files that are in here are getting imported into here, except these responsive ones down here because they get imported into the responsive less file. Which we'll look at in a little while. But um, one thing that's worth pointing out at this stage is that when you come to actually deploy, you can probably remove a lot of these because you're not going to use all of those in, in your CSS that you want to deploy. So if you're not using popovers and tooltips and modals, you can get rid of that because you don't need that, those classes anyway. Okay, so let's uh, <coughs> let us. Compile bootstrap less. And we'll have a CSS file now. And with any luck, there we go. Right, work. Okay. So so this is one of the demo files that you get. This is what we would normally see at the top of the bootstrap homepage is something awful lot like that. And you'll see that this looks like an end bootstrap because that's what it is. So that's that's your first step towards developing with Bootstrap. Uh, what I'm going to show you now is um, a little project that I have worked on. Now this is a, uh, I've changed the company name, you know, but, um, <laughs> and you can see actually this is uh, designed to be wider, so this has gone into the uh, responsive uh, menu structure up there. It should have a few menu items here, but they'll all be there now because it's narrower than the, the uh, page is expecting to be. Um, but this was put together in about a day from that, um, that file that we saw just now um, for a uh, client of the agency that I'm working for at the moment. Basically the, the guy came to me and said, look, um, we're going to see a client. They want a dashboard for health and safety stuff. And um, they want to show something to the board to kind of get buy-in for us to then go and pilot that. 
um, can you knock something up in Photoshop or something? I went, mm, I'd rather build something in HTML that they can actually play with and get an idea of the sorts of things this might be able to do for them. Um, and then, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll be you know, more excited about it and, uh, and they'll want to go for it. So, um, ordinarily, these buttons would be sitting up here, but as I say, the screen's a bit narrower and like, this isn't a properly responsive design yet because it's only cobbled together in, in a base. And normally this would be wider and these buttons would be next to each other. Um, but we've got, uh, we've got a nice little auto-complete box down here. Uh, we've got buttons that appear when you mouse over and they've got you know, a little bit of a, a hint of some sort of functionality going on there that isn't really there, but you know, could be. Uh, we can go to list view on the uh, on the calendar, which is just probably the class on that calendar. It's just a list. Um, so if I, this is exactly the same markup, both views, just totally in class. Um, and then we've got stuff like so. This is this is a bootstrap element here. This little batch. That's one of the things that comes out of uh, out of the, the uh, framework. We've got a sort of alert box up there, which is part of the framework. And so with that, we have a nice bit of uh, JavaScript that will dismiss that when we click the box. Um, these little ticks here, these are um, some of those uh, glyph icons that I showed you earlier on. And if we click on one, then it changes to a cross to show that it's been done. And the number of, uh, the number of uh, tasks outstanding decreases. So, as I say, uh, my sort of